Hey guys, so in today's video, we're going to be talking about skill stock and why I think that this stock is potentially a growth stock, which despite in the current market, is actually offering good value. So for those of you that are unaware, Skills is an online mobile phone platform that brings together video gamers from all across the world in order to compete for cash prizes. So it has a really simple business model, which is great from an investor's perspective. So this was a stock that was actually brought to my attention back in January or February, when it was trading at around $30 a stock. And I saw that price and I said that there's no way that it was worth that. And I wasn't interested, right? And it actually shut up following that to $44. And then the inevitable happened, which it it fell, right? It fell off a cliff and it fell by 82% to where we are today at $8. But at $8, I certainly think that this is a stock where we could see a decent amount of capital growth. So over the last month, it's also 28% down. And actually on Friday, the 8th of October, this stock fell by 9%. And when you get into the detail of why the stock fell 9% on Friday, we can see that Cathy Woods sold 952,000 shares of skills. And skills now represents 0.48% of her ETF portfolio. So because there's been a 9% decrease in the share price in one day on the back of this news, you would assume that 952,000 of the shares that she sold represented the majority of her holding, right? That's not the case. So if we go to her holdings as of the 8th of October and we find skills within here, you can see that they are currently holding just short of 11 million shares, right? And she sold just short of a million shares. So in effect, she sold around 9% of her position. In other words, it's completely immaterial to the total ETF and to her total position as well. So I think this is a massive overreaction. But anyway, it sort of fits in with the fact that skills is downtrending as a whole anyway. So it's probably not that surprising. Anyway, all of that and what Kathy Woods is doing is completely irrelevant, right? We need to look at the fundamentals and the prospects of the business ourselves and make a decision based on that. So this is from their investor presentation. And this is a slide that I like quite a lot, right? So we can see here the minutes per paying user per day. And skills was actually better than TikTok, YouTube, Candy Crush, Facebook, Snapchat and a mobile gaming average, right? So in terms of minutes per paying user per day, Skills was notching up 60 minutes per user. So that's very good, right, compared to Candy Crush, which is the next best game, I think, at 38 minutes. So you can see here that they're generating 58% higher engagement than the number one mobile game, which of course is very good for the company. The longer that people play, the more revenue that they're going to generate, which then brings me on to this slide, right? So we can see here that they achieved revenue growth of 92% year over year back in 2020. But what's more impressive than that is the fact that they have gross margins of 95%. So this is a business that can prove to be extremely profitable and is growing at a very fast rate. So that is very, very impressive, right? So you won't find many companies that are growing their revenues at 92% year over year with gross margins as high as 95%. In fact, I'd go as far to say that you won't find many companies with gross margins as high as 95% full stop, right? So that is exceptional. And then you can see below here some of the accolades that they've won. So they featured within CNBC's top 50 disruptive companies, and they also featured within the top 100 most innovative companies. So they're making the headlines for all the right reasons. And then I'm sure we all know by now both the potential and the rate at which the gaming industry is growing. So you can see here that gaming has eclipsed movies, music, and books. The gaming industry currently has a total accessible market of $175 billion, and the mobile industry within that is $86 billion. But here's the thing, right? So the mobile industry is actually growing at a 23% compounded annual growth rate compared to the overall gaming industry, which is growing at 14%. Now you compare that to television, which is growing at just 4%, it's not going to take too long before the gaming industry is the largest out of all of the media industries. And then this slide here illustrates the business model. Now I really like this slide because it goes to show how simple the business model really is. But effectively, you can imagine that you've got two gamers and each of those pay a 60 cent fee to enter a game. And then effectively, skills will take their cut, which happens to be a 15% take rate. And effectively, whatever is left over will be distributed to the players or the winners of that game. Now, in this example, the 18 cents of revenue that they make, of course, they operate at 95% gross margins and therefore 17 cents of that is gross profit. And then you can see that they arrive at an adjusted EBITDA before user acquisition costs of 3 cents, which is 17% of revenue. Now we've seen that as high as 25%, and management have said that they are working towards a goal of between 25 and 30%, right? And you have to remember that number because we'll be using that in our valuation later on. Now, in terms of what that user acquisition cost actually is, now because of the type of business that it is, and that it is quite a young company, effectively what they do is they offer incentives or certain promotions, 
which they have to pay for in order to attract new customers. And so effectively, that's the cost of them acquiring new customers. We expect that as the business matures, as it becomes more well known, those user acquisition costs are going to fall significantly because they no longer need to attract new customers. And then quickly moving on to their latest quarterly results. So we can see here that revenue grew to $89 million during the quarter, and that was up 52% over the prior year. And that's with gross margins of 95%, which again is in line with the prior year. So very solid results. Net loss, however, did increase to $80 million during the second quarter of 2021, compared with a 20 million loss in the prior year. But I'll get on to why that is not a concern for me whatsoever later on. Then we've got cash on the balance sheet of $692 million and no debt at all. So their, their balance sheet is absolutely solid. So in terms of why that net loss isn't a concern for me, you have to understand why they're actually incurring a loss, right? So we can see here for the three months ended 30th of June 2021, they earned revenues of just shy of $90 billion. And their cost of revenues were only $4 billion, which meant that they have gross margins of 95%. Now in terms of their operating costs, Research and development isn't that high, it's only $10 million, and general admin costs are fairly low as well, at only $25 million. The large driver in that loss is the sales and marketing, right? So they actually spent $99.5 million on sales and marketing. Now, a large proportion of that is going to be those user acquisition costs that we were referring to earlier on. Now, again, once they've established their user base, they don't need to acquire new customers, right? Because the user base is already established. And when that happens, we can expect to see that sales and marketing expense as a percentage of revenue to fall dramatically. So actually where this looks like, this is a company that's losing so much money, right? So they're losing $80 million on $90 million of revenue. You actually have to understand that if they were to remove a large amount of that marketing expense, which they will be able to do once they do establish themselves, they're a profitable company. I don't expect that profitability will be a problem for this company. This is a company that generates gross margins of 95%. It's hard to believe that later down the line, they're not going to be profitable. So then your other concern might be, okay, fair enough, but what about actually getting to that stage of profitability at the point where they can actually reduce their marketing spend? Well, their balance sheet is really good, right? So they've got cash and cash equivalents of just short of $700 million and they've got absolutely no debt. So liquidity for this company is certainly not going to be an issue in the short term, and actually management are quite good with their capital allocation, right? So management were quite smart. So back in March 2021, they actually did a share offering, right? So they obviously saw that the share price was high, right? So generally speaking, we don't want a company to just to be constantly issuing shares, right? However, if a company is going to issue shares when the company's price is very high relative to its actual value, right and they're going to use that cash to expand the business then generally it's a good thing and that's exactly what management did here so back in march they offered a share issue and they were selling shares at 24 dollars per share and this was taken up completely right so they sold 17 million shares at 24 dollars per share we look now and the shares are selling at eight dollars per share so if you was a buyer of those shares at the time you'd probably be fairly annoyed right now right but from an overall perspective management did the right thing Okay, but what about a price target for the stock, right? So this is my 2025 price target. So we've got current share price of $8.15. 2021 revenue, according to management's guidance, is expected to be $390 million. And analysts are expecting $556 million for 2022. I've then, which is, by the way, 70% and 43% growth rates respectively. Before that, they achieved 92% revenue growth the year before. So I'm expecting that, or I've forecast that within 2023, 2024 and 2025, they will achieve a flat 30% revenue growth year over year. So my expectations is for revenue growth to slow down as you would expect, but only down to 30% per year. That means that by 2025, they will have revenues of $1.2 billion. We then need to apply a enterprise value to sales multiple to that to try and arrive at our 2025 enterprise value. Now I've applied a multiple of five. So the current multiple is 6.5, and I'm expecting that to drop by the time we get to 2025 to around five. And I've used that based on what are their competitors doing. So skills don't really have a direct competitor, right? But when we look at other gaming industries and we look at the valuations of those, if we look at, for example, Activision Blizzard, which of course is a creator of games, we can see that over the last five years, investors on average have been willing to pay 6.5 times revenues, right? Now we move across to, for example, EA or Electronic Arts, we can see that the average was 5.3. And then if we move to something 
arguably more similar, right? So Zinger, which is a creator of mobile games specifically, we can see the average over the last five years was 3.3. So I've gone somewhere in the middle of the road of all of those three, and I've replied an enterprise value to sales ratio or multiple of five. Now I'd say that that's quite prudent given how disruptive skills is, how it's growing a lot quicker than the others, and also how the gross margins are far superior to the other businesses. But just to remain on the safe or the prudent side, I'll go with five, and effectively that gives us a 2025 price target of $19.52. Gives us total upside of 140% and a compounded annual growth rate in that time of 24%. And then we apply a similar methodology for our EBITDA valuation. So we can see that in 2021, our EBITDA is expected to be $128 million loss. Uh, we apply the same growth rate to our revenues. So that's a 30% growth rate for the next sort of three years from 2022 onwards. And we're actually going to input an EBITDA margin of 25%. Now, remember earlier in the video, I said that management have already indicated that EBITDA margins of 25% is more than achievable when they take into account the fact that they can reduce or scale back that user acquisition marketing cost. And I actually think that 25% margins is pretty low for a company that actually is achieving gross margins of 95% and of which the majority of the operating costs are actually marketing, right? So when they scale back that marketing, I wouldn't be surprised to see their EBITDA margins as high as 30 or even 35%. Anyway, we'll leave it at 25% here. That gives us a 2025 EBITDA of $305 million. And then I've applied an enterprise value to EBITDA multiple to that. Now I've done exactly the same thing as I did for the enterprise value to sales multiple, right? So effectively, I've looked at the average across the three different sort of competitors or similar companies, right? So Zingers was 16 or actually 17, EA's was 15 and Activision Blizzard was 16. So I would say that I'm definitely being prudent by applying 16 here. Once again, that gives us to a 2025 price target of $15.61, which would be a total upside of 92% and a compounded annual growth rate of just under 18%. I take the average of the two and I get an average price target of just under $18 which would be a 116% upside over the next four years and a compounded annual growth rate of 21%. So this is definitely a stock that is looking very, very attractive. And if management can execute on effectively scaling back those user acquisition costs, then this is a no brainer. And it all really comes down to how much of their user base can they retain without offering these promotions and incurring high user acquisition costs. So we'll see how it plays out. I hope you've enjoyed the video and until next time, thank you.